friends to our weekly worship service. Thank you for taking the time to join with us today. One of the signs of a healthy church is the willingness and discipline to meet together regularly with the body of Christ. During these past few months, as I have contemplated my own spiritual, emotional, and physical health, I have found myself revisiting the passage from Galatians 5, 22, and 23 regarding the fruit of the Spirit. We all know that fruit is one part of a healthy diet for our physical bodies, so it is totally appropriate that Paul uses fruit to exemplify the recipe for a healthy life in general. What is the fruit of the Spirit? Many of you can say it with me. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These attributes will never let us down. I want to do my part to continue to live healthily as a husband, as a father, as a son, as a friend, as a leader, as a musician, as a church member, and something that is quite new to me, even as a grandfather. As we now worship together, the God who longs for each person to be healthy in all ways, let's commit ourselves again this week to being the fruit of the Spirit. Hello, friends. I'm excited, as always, to be able to sing with you. Even though I can't hear you, I know that you are singing where you are, and the Lord knows that, that we're singing to Him and about Him. And today we're just going to sing a little bit about um, His power and His ability to save us. He is our Savior, and I'm so thankful that He did that for us. So we're going to sing a little bit about salvation today. First, we're going to start with a song called Mighty to Save. a song called Oh Happy Day. It's number 532 if you're using a hymnal, and we'll sing the first, the third, and the fourth stanzas together. Oh Happy Day. Happy day. 
tis done the great transactions done i am my lord's and he is mine he drew me and i followed on charm to confess the voice divine happy day Through the, through the scriptures, through Jesus' own life, through his words to his disciples, through God's work, through his prophets, we have long since been invited to come into his presence, to bring our praises and those things that concern us. Whether we are living in our darkest, deepest, most trying days, or whether we are living in the most glorious, brightest, most light days, or even if we fall somewhere in between, we are welcomed into his presence. So this morning we're gonna do that together. Would you take a moment to ready your heart that we might pray together? Father, Son, and Spirit, we love you. We are grateful to be in your presence, not just today, but always. We find that we are often distracted by our busy, by our trials, and even by our monotony. But this morning, let us start afresh with humble hearts and bring our chorus of thanksgiving and our litany of trouble. And then, Lord, would you help us to wait and to listen for your voice. Lord, you have given us your scripture, which men and women through the ages have given back to us, set to tunes, so that the truth of your word would echo again and again in our hearts and in our minds. Father, this morning, the song that echoes through my mind, the one that points to you, is the one that focuses on Christ as our firm foundation. Would these words of the hymn now be our confession and our anthem? Jesus, my hope is built on nothing less than your blood and your righteousness. I do not trust the sweetest frame, but I wholly lean on your name. When the darkness veils your lovely face, I rest on your unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. Father, your oath, your covenant, Jesus, your blood, support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, you are my hope and my stay. 
Jesus, when you shall come with the trumpet sound, O oh, may I then in you be found, dressed in your righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. What a glorious day that will be. Jesus, you are the solid rock. Anywhere else, to whomever else that I may turn, I will only find sinking sand. So may it be true of my life. All of my days, from the most trying to the most joyous and all the days in between, may it be true that it is upon you, Jesus, and upon your word that I stand. You are the solid rock. All others sinking sand. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, thank you for hearing us. We love you. It's in Jesus' precious name that we pray. Amen. Good morning, boys and girls. This is your time. I hope you had a good week. I'm down in the old bus this morning. You know, this thing hasn't gone on a trip in so long. I thought I'd come down and see if it would start. So let's check it out. Started right up, didn't it? And you say road trip? Oh, I'd love to take one with you soon. You know, talking about starting things up, we are starting to have church services at the church again this week. But some things are going to be different about it. You know, some of us are in the gym, some of us are in the sanctuary, some of us are at home, some of us are dressed up with our hair combed, and others of us are still in our PJs with bedhead. I wonder if Pastor Darrell is ever going to preach in his pajamas. Now that would be different. I know for sure he hasn't combed his hair. That hasn't changed, and I don't, I don't think that ever will. But other things about our worship service are going to be different. During the children's time, you won't come up front. There's no children's worship. We probably won't be singing songs together for a while. We can't shake hands. The rows of chairs are six feet apart. There's no Sunday school. And there's no sleeping. And I know that's really devastating for some people. Hmm. Even though a lot has changed about the way we do worship, the reason we worship hasn't changed. That's still the same. We come together for worship because we want to tell God that we love Him. And we want to give Him special time to talk to us and tell us how much He loves us. And even though we aren't going to be doing a lot of the things we usually do. We are still going to be doing the thing we usually do. Worshiping God together. We are going to be here as a group of people, whether we're at home, in the gym, or in the sanctuary. We're going to be a group of people together saying the same thing. God, we love you. Thank you for loving us. Now, if you don't mind, I'm going to go ahead and take this old bus on a spin. But you know, there's something missing about it. Something's different. I know what's missing. You are. I can't wait for the day when you all can be packed in this bus again and we can take a trip together. Can we do that soon? I sure hope so. Let's do it as soon as we can.
scripture this morning is from the book of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, uh, chapter 7. Uh, just a few verses uh, from the end of the, the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, words of Jesus, which I'd, I'd like to read for you. Beginning at verse 9, Matthew chapter 7, verse 9, Jesus says, Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Therefore, in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this is the law and the prophets. Have have you ever experienced a time when it seemed like the world was just passing you by. Uh, now, I don't, I don't mean really in specific ways like, like uh, fashion or, or morals or whatever, although in, in many ways uh, the world has passed us by and not for the better in, in some of those ways. Uh, actually, the world has passed some of us by with regard to fashion so long ago that we are coming back around. Uh, but but I, I really mean in general. Uh, that the world has just sort of gone on without you. We, we tend to notice that, I think, particularly when we're going through something difficult. I know I thought that, especially when I've been sick, and, uh, and it's, it's really noticeable when the weather is beautiful, you know, when the temperature's mild and the sun is out and, and I'm sick, lying inside on the couch, or whatever, but I look out the window and I see that life is just going on as normal for everybody else. You know, neighbors are mowing their lawns and washing cars and working in their gardens and things. Kids are out playing, riding bikes. Uh, traffic is moving. There's parties, there's sports, just the normal stuff of life. It, it all just goes right on. I remember noticing that when, when my dad died. Uh, it was actually on the way from the funeral home to the cemetery. I noticed, you know, all the traffic is just going on like normal. There's people in their cars, they're going shopping, they're going out to eat, they're going here and there. And I'm, I'm just thinking, don't they know that we're burying my dad today? Uh, their lives go on, business as usual. And yet for me and, and for our family, it was anything but business as usual. I would think nearly all of us know what that feels like. If you don't, you will one day. Yesterday, we buried the body of our friend and our brother, Don Joy, up at Bluegrass uh, Gardens Cemetery. Don died peacefully the previous Saturday night. And I know that, that in those moments, Don and Robbie's world and the world of their family and friends did uh, stop, you know, just like I described. And yet, because of all that is going on in our larger world in these days, uh, what struck me about Don's death is, is actually just the opposite. Uh, in, in many ways, it is our world that has stopped, you see. Uh, and it has done that for, for several reasons. I mean, the, the coronavirus, certainly, that's a, that's a big part of it. Our world has been on, on sort of a pause for weeks now because of that. You know, honestly, I, I might just say, I think even the wild animals recognize how the human world has stopped because of this virus. And I'll tell you why. I have hit more birds with my car while driving in the last few months than, than I have hit, I think, altogether before in my life. And, and of course, you know, I can't prove it, but, but I really think that's because those birds are braver with regard to the roads because there's less traffic. I, I think they know that. I think they know that our world has stopped. And it's the same thing with squirrels and raccoons and groundhogs and deer, at least with regard to their appearance on our streets and roads. It seems like the rest of the world knows that the human world has, has all but stopped because of this virus. Um, and then, of course, there's 
there's the fact that the world has stopped to some degree because of what happened to George Floyd and, and Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery and and others. The the racial tensions in our nation right now have in many ways put the brakes on our business as usual national life as, as we we come to terms with those things. We we stop and we pause. So so life in our nation and, and our world really it's not just in our nation but it's around the world. Life here has in many ways uh, been uh, paused. And and yet Don Joy went right ahead and died in spite of that. Uh, in spite of all these enormous events that have put our world on pause, Don just went ahead and traveled right on into glory last Saturday, which is just business as usual in our fallen world. You know, worn out bodies, broken bodies give up. And, and our Heavenly Father receives those in Christ to Himself. That is business as usual in our world. And that goes on even when everything else in the world has stopped. Even when everything else in the world is not business as usual. It struck me how funny it is that, that it works that way. The fact is, there are things in life that just occur regardless of what else might be going on around us, regardless of whether or not we want them to happen, regardless of whether or not we have time for them to happen. Birth and life and love and death, those things just continue to happen, even in the midst of hurricanes and pandemics and uh, national emergencies, wars, even election years, you know. And you know, when those things happen, if we will let them, they will pull us back to reality and remind us of what's really important and of what's really eternal. They will refocus our attention um, on that which is really essential. Those are the moments in life to pay attention to. Um, if, uh, if you knew Don Joy, you, you, you know he had a big vocabulary. Uh, just personally speaking, I remember him using words at times that I had to look up in order to find their meaning. Uh, and that was true whether he was teaching or preaching or, or just talking with you uh, or praying. And yet, uh, as with most of us, as he aged, as Don aged, he began to, to settle back on those more elemental things that were deeply ingrained in him, so much a part of him. Robbie told me Don would, would typically, he was the one to, to pray at meals, and he would always do that extemporaneously. You know, he would, he would make it up as you go. Uh, some might say he would follow the lead of the Spirit, but extemporaneous prayer is making it up as you go. Um, but as time went on, he, he moved to praying the Lord's Prayer something that is ingrained, something that is there. And then more, more recently even, when he would lead in prayer before meals, as he always did and as he still did, he prayed the God is great, God is good prayer. Uh, now, uh, some, of course, would lament that loss of, of memory and, and sharpness of mind that that and that just comes with age and of course we 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 lament that but you know the fact is that simple children's prayer communicates all that really needs to be communicated about god and his character and his provision doesn't it i mean when you think about it god is great god is good and we thank him for our food by his hands we all are fed give us lord our daily bread. Now, there are certainly more eloquent, there are more complex ways to say it, but that is the essence of a thankful heart. It's the same thing is, uh, is true with regard to songs. You know, I mean, you can sing songs about God that are big, you can sing songs about God that are loud or that are, are very musically or lyrically complicated or maybe deeply theological or, or any combination of those things. But you know, really, isn't the song that communicates as fully as any the essence of who God is and what God has done, isn't that song really just Jesus loves me? 
This I know, for the Bible tells me so. Uh, you see, so often, truth, substance, where God's concerned, is usually pretty simple. Uh, we are typically the ones who complicate things. We lay layers upon layers of things. But God's truth, God's substance, is pretty simple. And we need times of not business as usual in our lives in order to remember that, I think, to, to bring us back to those things that are truly essential and maybe look at those with new eyes. I think we see that, that very principle in this morning's scripture text, which is, as I said, more or less the, the, the tail end of Jesus' sermon on the Mount. If you take it as a whole, chapters five through seven of the book of Matthew, uh, what is the point of, of that block of, of teaching of Jesus? I would say the point is to describe the kingdom of God and to describe the way that God's people, kingdom people, live. This is the way kingdom people think. This is what kingdom people value. Uh, this is, is how kingdom people treat other people. These are the priorities that kingdom people set in their lives. Uh, it seems to me that if you want to get a picture of what life with God is like, what heaven is like, what life on earth was created to be like, was supposed to be like, if not for the fall, if you want to get a picture of all of that, then this is that picture. Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. To the point that, you know, if you don't like what you read in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, uh, if you don't like the sort of thing that those chapters describe, then, then I'm afraid you're probably not going to like heaven too much. That is Jesus' model for a kingdom-centered God-centered society. Uh, that's his description of it and his model of it. Now, now, I know that we look at some of those principles and commands there that Jesus says it, and, and really, and, and we're tempted to say, man, I can't do that. And that's true. And that's exactly why God sent his Holy Spirit to his people, to his, to his church. We talked about that on Pentecost Sunday a few Sundays ago. God knows that his people, under the curse of a fallen world, can't live in these ways in our own power. That's what Pentecost was for, to empower his people to think kingdom thoughts and to embrace kingdom values and to engage with others in true kingdom love. You see, this, this whole thing, this is a system that Jesus gives us here. Uh, it is a moral, ethical, spiritual system for life. Uh, now, please, please note, let, let me say, this is not a system to bring us into relationship with God. Some have thought that through the ages. Some have thought that it was. Some have thought, well, if I do all of this well enough, if I try really hard and if I accomplish all this, then maybe I will earn my way into salvation. And that's not it at all. That's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus has earned our salvation for us. We are invited into relationship with God the Father, not because of our righteousness, but because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So this is not Jesus describing here how to enter into relationship with God. What we have from Jesus here is a description of the way, the only way, that allows us to live successfully in peace with God and with each other in God's kingdom, you see. This is not the way to the kingdom of God. This is the way of the kingdom of God. Maybe to, to put it in more earthly terms, th think of the kingdom of God as, as just an earthly country, a, a nation that you always wanted to move to and, and live in. You always wanted to become a citizen of that nation. Well, this that Jesus gives us, that's not, this is not the immigration test that allows you entry into the new land. This is the law of the land once you enter in, you see. This is how citizens of that land 
live and think and relate one to another. Like Jesus says there in verse 24, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock such that whatever comes, that house continued to stand because it had its foundation on the rock. These are the ways of God's people made possible for, for actual implementation in our lives by the power of God's spirit. And, and of course, you know, a lot of time could be spent picking these chapters apart and looking at these principles uh, individually. And we have done that from time to time in the past, and it's a worthwhile endeavor. Um, but what I want to say this morning is that Jesus, you notice, also gave us a, a for dummies version of, of all of this. I mean, not really for dummies, but, but, but the essence of these three chapters, Jesus presents to us. He, he gives us a, a summary statement, if you will, there in verse 12. And they are words that are so well known uh, to, to so many. Jesus says, in all things, therefore, do to others as you would like them to do to you. This is the law and the prophets. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Now, we've called this uh, the golden rule. And, and let me, before we go any further, let me just quickly say about this. Uh, if you pull this statement, if you pull the golden rule out of its context, as some have tried to do, the truth is it, it can quickly become just very egocentric. It can leave people to think that they are the measure of whether their behavior toward others is good or not. Because if you pull it out of context, it can quickly degenerate to stand for something like, well, if I don't mind it, then they shouldn't mind it either. You know, I'll do to them as they ought to do to me. I don't mind if they do that to me, so they shouldn't mind if I do that to them. And, and some have tried to do that. Some have tried to make it fit their own personal agendas. But uh, you can't do that with the golden rule because it is given to us in a context, in, in this very specific context of Jesus' ethical commands. You see, it's the same either in Luke or in Matthew. It's given in the context of Jesus' ethics. Um, now, actually, several English versions of the Bible don't translate the word therefore that begins the phrase in the original Greek. It's just not there in some English versions. And that's really unfortunate because it is there. <laughs> and it's important to realize that the therefore is there because it's the therefore that ties the summary, the golden rule, to everything that comes before it. You know, Jesus says this and this and this and this and this. Therefore, do to others as you would have them do to you. So what's it mean? What's all that mean? Well, it means that it's as if Jesus is saying here, okay, you want an abbreviated version of how children of God, uh, you want an abbreviated version of how followers of Christ, of how kingdom people think and act toward other people? You want to know how, how people should treat other people? how they will treat other people in heaven, in God's kingdom. Well, here it is. In God's kingdom, people do to others what they would want others to do to them. In God's kingdom, people think about others the way they'd want others to think about them. In God's kingdom, for God's people, people talk about others in the ways that they would want others to talk about them. All according to God's ethic and definition of goodness and righteousness and fairness and, and justice. You see, kingdom people do to others as kingdom people would want others to do to them, to us. <laughs> it's, it's not really all that complicated. It's, it's pretty foundational. Uh, and it's the only foundation that can support a healthy marriage, a healthy family, a healthy church, a healthy community, and a healthy society or nation. You see, anything less than this very sort of, of mutual respect and honor and love, anything less than that, and it's only a matter of time 
before people will not be able to get on with each other because this, what Jesus gives us, this is how God designed us to live. This is what God made us to do. This is how he intends us to treat one another. And again, he knows that in our fallen state, that's impossible. So he's made his spirit available to us to change us from the inside out, to empower us to be the people that he made us to be. Because he knows very well, apart from that sort of transformation, we will not do to others as we want done to us. Apart from, from Holy Spirit-led transformation, we will use other people for our own ends. We will abuse other people. We will enslave other people. We will jump to wrong conclusions about other people. We will steal from other people. We will put other people down and we will call other people names if it benefits us, you see. It's true. And you know it is. We've done it. We're guilty of it. Every one of us. The church is guilty of it. Our nation is guilty of it. And our race, regardless of what it is, in some place and at some time, has been guilty of it. A friend told me just this week, you know, the thing is, is it's not nearly so much about skin as it is about sin. Manifested as pride. That I am better than you. And that, that is a mortal wound in the life of every human person because of the fall. And it will consume us eternally unless we face it wherever we see it. We call it the sin that it is. We seek the forgiveness of Christ and of those that we've offended. And we open ourselves to the power of his spirit to cleanse us of it and to change us, to change how we think and how we act and how we value, to change us from the inside out. You see, the, the things that are going on in our nation today and the things that have gone on in our nation in days past, it's all evidence of it. Whether you believe it or not, uh, in the past and in the present, we have all said that someone else doesn't matter as much as me. <laughs> we've said it by our actions. We've said it by our words, but we've said it somehow. You don't matter as much as I do. And yet the kingdom ethic of Jesus says, you matter to me as much as I matter to me. In fact, you matter more. You matter more. That's what the love of the cross looks like, you see. That is the way of God's kingdom. And let's be honest, it's the kind of world we all want to live in. But we don't get there by denying the past and we don't get there by force we get there by the power of the holy spirit pouring god's love into us so that we can see our own blind spots and so that we can truly love others and so that we can walk hand in hand as true equals so we can presume the best of others so we can do to others as we would have them do to us and so that we can be one so that we can be one in the one in the only one who makes people truly one you know both uh, tony dungy and max lucado uh, have recently said uh, in in their own words but but it means the same thing. They both said in just the last couple of weeks that this is a tremendous opportunity for the American church of all colors to reveal Christ to our broken and divided nation. This is the moment of not business as usual. This is the moment when our world has stopped. 
that if we would, Christ's people can reveal the very essence of his nature and his character. We can show the world what real love and real respect and real acceptance and real equality and real unity really means. We could show him what it really looks like. Will we do that as a people? as a church? Will we let the Holy Spirit so fill us with love that we have love to give to others, that we have love to show to all others, and that we have the ability to examine ourselves as the Spirit leads us and say, oh Lord, forgive me for that. Forgive me for thinking that. Forgive me for doing that. Forgiving me, forgive me for suggesting that in the face of our brothers and sisters in Christ of all colors. Will we do that as a people and as a church? Let's pray. Father, would you, would you help us, all of us, see how important it is to our world and to our nation and, and to your kingdom? Would you help us see how important it is to your heart for your church to take up our part in really being and living Christ. Day to day, moment to moment, in the big events and in the times when we're alone in our thoughts and in our presuppositions of others, would you help us take up our part in really being and living Christ in the power of your spirit and in the way of your kingdom we ask in the name of your Son, our Savior Jesus. Amen. We're going to respond by singing Blessed Assurance. It's number 345 in your hymnal. Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation. Purchase of God, born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission. his goodness and lost in his love. May that be your story and my story so that in these days of deep division in our nation, by the power of God's Spirit, we can be reconcilers. We can be the peacemakers. We can be the pure in heart examples of Jesus that our world so desperately needs to know and see and experience. May we be loving and true 
instruments of God's peace, faithfully pointing those around us to Jesus. The Lord bless and keep you.